Sorry the conceptual question. So this is something I'm doing as a result of request from some people um, to just go over conceptual questions that I think uh, that works out with uh, this uh, semester's weird timing with the virtual class session, which is that, you know, it comes uh, somewhat a little bit before this and <laughs> so long after the problems that were due. So, um, so let me get to this. And let's see. Um, I think uh, it's uh, worth it just to, because uh, for this week's conceptual questions, so many of it really uh, goes to Gauss's law, uh, which is what the subject of your lab was, the worksheet lab. And um, and stated, uh, Gauss's law can be stated really simply. It's, uh, uh, you know, the net electric flux through a closed surface, which um, the phi symbol is not quite doing justice. Um, so it's uh, really this uh, notation I prefer with the circle here that actually tells you that it's a surface integral over a closed surface <laughs> of an electric field dotted to area element. Um, when you do that, then the result is, so I'm writing it in this form, four pi k, a Coulomb constant, the charge enclosed. I know your textbook uh, expresses it in this form, uh, charge enclosed over epsilon naught. And in some sense, they are just the equivalent because um, the Coulomb constant that we have been using and actually for this class we will continue to use, it's uh, equal, uh, numerically equal to one over four pi epsilon naught. Um, I'm mainly retaining the use of Coulomb constant uh, based on some feedback that I got. Um, to uh, Coulomb, it it helps to demonstrate the unity of electricity, magnetism, and uh, speed of light uh, better uh, when you continue to use Coulomb constant uh, rather than dry, dropping it at this point in the semester as most uh, um, most textbooks do. And actually most of my recorded lecture videos, one that comes from the in-person class back in 2018, it actually does the same thing that the textbook does. But anyways, so we'll just skip this. And conceptually, what's important is that when you calculate this quantity, that it's proportional to the total charge enclosed. And I hope the uh, the, the worksheet lab that we, that we went through on Tuesday helps you see that, that that fact is intuitively true. And it's also kind of in the context of electrostatics, the way we go. So the Gauss's law is one of the fundamental law of nature. So uh, even if it doesn't seem intuitively true, well, <laughs> oh, this is like our axiom. It's our starting point where we uh, say this is true and figure out the rest of the laws. So when you look at a question like question one, which says that this figure shows an arrangement where the net flux through the is zero, then um, um, then where it says, is the net flux through a closed surface always zero? Well, we look to Gauss's law. So what the question is saying is we would like this part not to be zero. And if that's the case, we need this part not to be zero. So the only way that can happen is if the charge enclosed is not zero. So that's what it's getting at. So it's not always zero. So if no, then you must have a charge enclosed within the closed surface. And um, the open surface, the surface is bounded by a closed loop. Oh. So yeah, it's, let me draw the figure. I think this is where this. Uh, so um, I could get an open surface out of what's demonstrated here. And actually, so you know, this would be an example of open surface. It's uh, so this uh, um, it says it's uh, bounded by a closed loop, and you can consider this rectangle thing that I drew as your closed loop, and it's uh, bounding this uh, surface here. So that's a, a definition of open surface, like it's, it's a definition you would see in like in a topology class, and it's asking. Um, Uh, can the net flux through an open space place in a region of non-electric field be zero? Oh, uh, we, this was one of the questions in the lab. Yes, the answer is yes. And uh, 
the thing that I drew on the board um, as part of the lab was if you have electric field like this, then imagine holding a surface like in this orientation. So this is like the side view so that your area vector for the surface goes this way. Then uh, when you calculate the flux of this open surface, E dot A is equal to zero. And electric field wasn't zero, area wasn't zero. So the top product just worked out to be zero. Um, yeah, I guess I gave the whole answer. All right, uh, let's keep going. Uh, question two. If the, so the rest of the set, I think, uh, more or less goes along this. There's an application of Gauss's law in the context of um, conduct conductors where I'll um, give some pointer. Uh, if uh, the electric flux through a closed surface zero, is the electric field necessarily zero? The answer is no. Um, just you know, look up here. <laughs> <laughs> electric flux was zero and the electric field was clearly not zero. Uh, can there be electric charges present within the surface? This is a bit of a trick question. Um, so the the thing of uh, the key thing around the trick is that when we are saying charge and closed, this is really net charge and closed. So. Um, you could have positive and minus charge present inside in a particular way where you do have charges within and the net flux through a closed surface would be zero. Um, and yeah, so that C is getting at the more concrete aspect of this. So here, yes, it must be zero. That's the uh, Gauss's law. Um, and what, if any, are the constraints on what charges can be present outside the surface? Um, the answer is no constraint. And you can add all. So it's a really, this question is getting at what Gauss's law means and what it doesn't mean. Uh, Gauss's law puts a certain restrictions on what kind of things can happen, and um, it, it doesn't place restrictions on certain things. All these parts are trying to get at the details of that. So, question three Gauss's law and Coulomb's law right, are closely related. Um, yeah, there are forces. Uh, there's a lecture I do for physics force called um, uh, Yukawa uh, <laughs> method, where uh, you know the consideration for that was a force falling off like that Yukawa type uh, potential. Uh, top of the inverse scale. If there's any, yeah. answer the following two questions. For such a field, would there be a law like Gauss's law? Um, the simple answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> Explain why or why not. Uh, how would the net flux through a closed surface containing a charge or, uh, become smaller? Or I think this might be useful to just to demonstrate what that looks like. So imagine this a uh, hypothetical scenario where you have um, where you have um, some kind of a field. Oh, I'm trying to come up with a letter where we haven't used. Let me use lower case some kind of a field, which is going to be kind of like electric field in that it'll be a function of distance and it'll be like central field. So I don't have to worry about different angular thing. And it'll be some uh, constant divided by R squared. That part looks like Coulomb's law and we'll have this addition. It'll have this exponential decay, e to the minus some distance dependence over some length scale. And we'll make the direction of this field like uh, uh, Coulomb's law, it's just radially outward. So uh, with this, we can actually imagine doing calculation like this. Um, so we can do the field, the product with the DA. Uh, let's just do the simplest possible scenario where we are considering sphere of radius R and with the source of the field at the center. Uh, if we are doing that, then the explicit formal look like um, C over R squared e to the minus R over lambda, since that's at the source, times, and uh, it's going to be a triple integral <laughs> going with, uh, so the, um, uh, let me not make it more complicated than it needs to be. I think I can make it 
Oh wait, it's not triple integral. It's double integral technically. Um, so uh, let me do the proper double integral. So it'll be double integral with respect to v going from zero to two pi, and theta going from zero to pi. Um, this is, I think I have a lecture video on spherical coordinate system. Watch that, that's the same convention that I'm using here. And for the area element, um, so it's an element within a sphere, like on the surface of the sphere, and what that, um, one of the sides will look like rd theta, and the other side would uh, look like, uh, so I think r sine theta d phi. Um, so that's the double integral that we are doing. And just to cut the chase short, the angular integrals, they end up being super simple. Phi integral will just give us a factor of two pi. And the theta integral uh, with this sine theta there will just give us a factor of uh, a factor of uh, two. So it ends up being just short circuiting all of this. I don't waste too much time. We'll have a factor of four pi times and um, oh, I, and I have done all the integral. So I have r squared. Um, oh yeah, that's the surface <laughs> area of a sphere times all of this integrand that was all constant with respect to theta. So c over r squared times e to the minus r over lambda. So the kind of the uh, simplifications you saw uh, in lab is that still happens. R squared here cancels out this r squared. So uh, and C would somehow relate to all this constant stuff that you had before. So what you really have is this additional factor. You have this exponential decay factor that remains after you've taken this kind of flux-like quantity. And you can look at, in the context of part B, how this would look like as this closed surface becomes smaller. I guess meaning r is radius of the sphere is going to zero. So r going to zero. Well, looking at e to the minus zero over lambda, I think that just goes to one. Uh, you know, e to the zero is zero. So, or e to the zero is one. So in the limit where r goes to zero, this factor becomes one. So it's as though this uh, exponential decay didn't matter at all. So, um, so that in that limit, um, it would just look like Coulomb's law. When it gets larger, that's where um, it's now. So that's the same as before. When it gets larger, meaning r is approaching infinity, that's where it's beginning to look different because it's e to the minus infinity. Then you know it's a uh, so it's like. 1 over e to the infinity over lambda. So this quantity is blowing up to infinity. So this will go to 0. So this factor here, this will be going to 0. So this entire integral uh, will be going to 0. So uh, you have something that started to look like a Gauss's law in the limit where radius is very small. But as you go to larger radius, because the, the field it decays so much faster than the, the surface area, it uh, this quantity goes to zero. Um, and when we talk about, so this is more of a modern physics stuff. I, that's really why I ask this question. Um, uh, it, you, we talk about in uh, long range force and short range force. And electricity is an example of long range force. And part of that is related to the fact that it has this one over r squared dependence. That's the kind of dependence that results in a law like Gauss's law. And you could have, uh, in you could uh, in theory, have infinitely large sphere that's containing one small charge in the middle and the, the flux will still depend on that charge like at an infinite distance, it's long range. But there are other types of force that have this kind of dependence. Those are short range of forces. There are um, for those forces where if you go to a large enough radius, then um, then its influence on the universe will be negligible.
Yeah, I think there was a, re- a question on last uh, conceptual questions that was somewhat related to this kind of comparing gravity with the electrostatic force, uh, mainly on that um, both are long range forces, but somehow at astronomical scale you only see gravity, not you know static electricity. Uh, but it, the, that the reason for that is not that electricity is a short range force; it's a still a long range force, and that <laughs> this is about okay. That's more time than we should have spent there. Um, so, explain the role that symmetry plays in the application of Gauss's law. Yeah, so uh, there are lectures. Uh, I think I give lecture for all of them. Watch them, um, <laughs> and uh, in this context. Just looking at Gauss's law here, what it amounts to is that you have this electric field trapped under an integral sign. So most the application of Gauss's law, you're not interested in the flux. No one really cares about flux. Not until we get to Faraday's law. Um, so we're not interested in the flux. Um, we are trying to get to the electric field. And in order to get to this quantity, to get to this function inside an integral, you need some way to, some excuse to pull it out. And it's the symmetry that, that allows you to do that. When you look at the examples, spherical symmetry, cylindrical symmetry, and um, Cartesian symmetry, um, what you will see is that in all those three cases, we are able to come up with some kind of Gaussian surface in which um, we can argue that this e dot da is constant over different points so that we can pull this e out. Then once we've done that, then we can work out the rest and solve for e. So symmetry allows you to pull this electric field out of the integral. Um, without symmetry, you can't do that. So you can't. Gauss's law is still true. The, the, you know, when you do this flux calculation, you still get that, but you can't apply it to get the electric field. So, OK, uh, question five, charge Q is placed here. Um, will a charge outside the conductor experience an electric field due to presence of Q? Yeah, this is an uh, um, uh, interesting question. <laughs> so I guess uh, you, uh, um, so there is a simple answer that will actually say um, that will actually be correct. So you know, imagine a Gaussian surface like this. You are way out here. You are looking for that. Um, you you are looking for um, what's going on in here. And if you are trying to look at what's happening with the Gauss's law in this uh, setup, well, uh, Gauss's law says that the flux through this surface. Is net flux is given by four pi k charge enclosed. So the conductor, um, well, the, it doesn't say conductor is neutral, but let's assume conductor is neutral, just to make things simpler. Then with a neutral conductor here, I have charge here, so whatever flux is out here must be given by that charge, uh, which means there's an influence of the charge. Great. I think we are all done. And you know, that's a simple answer that's actually correct. I wouldn't take anything away from that. Um, uh, I guess uh, um, the complication I was thinking of is where, you know, sometimes people think about this situation for the right amount of time. And when you do, uh, this is something that I hope bothers you if you think about it. Um, if you are thinking of net electric flux through this surface, which is inside this conductor, then from the properties of conductor, which if you've seen it in the lecture, you know the electric field inside the conductor is zero under static electricity conditions. So these, uh, the flux here, when you calculate it, that's going to be zero. Because electric field everywhere here was zero. Uh, what's going on? I thought I had a charge enclosed. Um, so what this means is the because the charge is placed here inside the cavity within a conductor, it has it must have attracted some negative charges on this surface um, around this positive charge 
in such amount that this plus Q is cancelled out by these negative charges. So within this surface, yes, a net, net zero charge is enclosed. That's why flux through there is zero. Now, if you're thinking just that, then it's easy to get into trap of thinking, oh, then outside this, this presence of charge doesn't do anything. No, that's not the case either. Because outside here, it is correct that total net flux is this. It, it somehow went from zero to that. So what that must mean is, oh, yeah, because the conductor is neutral, if you took negative charges in here, there must be now positive charges on the outer surface of the conductor. So now one thing, one interesting thing that you can derive from considering all this is it almost doesn't matter where within the uh, conductor the cavity is. So it's a, a little bit easier to demonstrate or easier to see the significance of with a spherical conductor. So um, if you had a, like a point charge here um, and no conductor, then the kind of electric field you would have around, like with this being the origin, um, kind of electric field you would have at different points in space, it will be different from if you had a charge here. But if you somehow have cavity around this, so let all this happen within this spherical conductor, then the kind of the positive charge that you would have on the outside of the conductor, they are symmetrically distributed. So that the electric fields you would see at this point, they will look like they come from a point charge at the center. Yeah. Conductors in electrostatics is very interesting. So I have a few uh, like lectures on the conductor properties that's a little bit spread out throughout. So you have a uh, like couple that uh, I do in connection with the Gauss's law, and there will be a, a couple, couple or one or two more um, as we talk about voltage in the coming weeks. So, so I think that's all the things I would say about these conceptual questions. Um, well, unless there are any questions, I'll probably leave things there. Um, I feel like I'm spending more and more time with these. Maybe I should have planned out better. 20 minutes? Um, I don't know. Oh. Yeah.